what we're going to do today is, is the last of, of the unit of Prophets and Prophecies, and we're going to look at this phenomenon of the quote-unquote false prophet. And if I had a smart board behind me, I would have pulled up. There's a great scene from Monty Python's Life of Brian, which is actually, as much as it's heretical, is very historically based, very well based. And there's this scene in Life of Brian where you basically have these people standing on soapboxes soap and like predicting gloom and doom and of course they have varying opinions of gloom and doom and then they get into this big brawl about their associate but that's kind of what we're dealing with so um, what I gave, gave you you have in front of you is, is where the Torah discusses this concept of a, of a Navi Sheker and I don't know if Javi will actually remember this from last year but I'm not going to put you on the spot mm -hmm. but if you do you can like chime in mm -hmm. of what you remember so fundamental rule of the Torah is the Torah doesn't contain things that are not relevant. So if there is a halacha not to do something, that means that people have the proclivity to do it. If the Torah discusses this idea of a Navi Shekya, what we're going to talk about, um, that means they existed. These were real, real things. Um, so whatever's in there gives you a sense of what's in the universe. Um, hi. Hi, Chief. You need hi, one of the folding chairs. One of the folding chairs? Okay. Thank you. Here, we can give this to Allison when she sits. Um, okay, so we're just, we're going to do the, the text. I'm going to read through the text inside. Um, and the, the last thing that the previous section talks about is that you should not add or take away anything from the, the body of Torah law. Obviously, it's a big question about rabbinic law, but this is kind of the, you know, so if somebody comes along and wants to change the law, you need to view them with a certain amount of healthy suspicion. So, ki yakum navi if there should arise amongst you a prophet or a dreamer, and this person is able to provide for you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder that he predicted comes true. And, and this is his proof of saying. So let us go after after. Uh, foreign gods that you are, don't know or you're not familiar with, and let us serve them. Lo tishma etivrei hanavi hagu o hacholei hacholei hagu. Do not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer. Ki menaseh Hashem alokeh hanachem, because God is testing you. Ladaat to know hayishchem ohabim et Hashem alokeh hanachem b'chol hanachem b'chol hanachem. Okay, so to know whether you love, truly love God, Hashem your God, with all your hearts and with all your souls. Okay, we're going to hopefully get to this last piece at the end, but right now I want to concentrate on, on the beginning. So the commentaries discuss what a Nabi Shekhar is and how this person can go about producing something that is theoretically miraculous, right? So, Because if we define a nace, right, a miracle, as something that is not only supernatural, but effectively breaks the laws of nature, rather than just bending it, it's something that is qualitatively different than David Blaine making the Statue of Liberty disappear, right? That's an, an illusion. A nace is something that is beyond illusion. So how is it that this person is credible, how can he do these things, whatever. So um, we're going to go through some of the Mepharshim and some of what, what they say. The first one that I want to do is, is the Rashbam. Um, he is Rashi's grandson. He's one of the Baal of Tosafot. Um, he is the brother of Rabbi Yona, which is something that I just learned like a month ago. I didn't know that. Um, so... I'm sorry, the brother of Rabbeinu Tam, not Rabbeinu Yoda, the brother of Rabbeinu Tam. 
So he says, so this this person, who we'll talk about in a second, how does he give you the ultimate fate? She yodim atidot al yidei ruach tum'ah ve'trafim be'ov ve'yidoni. So that there is somebody who can, in fact, predict the future through what he calls ruach tum'ah, some kind of, of impure spirit, some kind of divination, whether it's through a bone or through signs. In other words, the idea is as follows. God has put a certain amount of knowledge in the world. Okay? We have to have a little bit of a, of a, take a moment to talk about time and past, present, and future. Right? So we live in a context of time. We know the past because we can, so to speak, look at it. We know the present because we're in it, but we don't know the future because we're not in it yet. Now, at this point, we can use science to help predict the future, but as we saw with the Great Blizzard, even science has its limits. You know, similarly, how many times has the, the opposite happened, where a weather forecast will say, oh, it's going to be a beautiful day, and then there's a thunderstorm or a tornado or a snowstorm or whatever. In other words, science, predictive science has its, has its limits. So, that's... That's part A. But God, and this is based on the writings of Rabbi Arya Kaplan, Hashem lives in a universe that is completely unique. And that for Hashem, because Hashem is beyond time, there is no past, present, and future. Everything is just now. Um, and I always tell my students, don't think about that too hard mm -hmm. because your brain will explode because that's what happened to three out of four Tana'im who tried to figure this out, right? That's the four Tanaim who entered into the mysteries of the world, the four that went into, into the orchard, which is an acronym for um, shot, simple meaning, remez, hints, drash, the deeper meaning, and so, which is the Kabbalistic meaning. So when you go into, start really trying to understand the nature of God, if you're not fully grounded, and Rabbi Akiva spent the first 40 years of his life with sheep and their byproducts, um, your head really does explode. So don't think too hard about these words. They're not my words. They're Arya Kaplan's words. But So God is beyond time. So therefore, past, present, and future is not something that applies to God. So when Hashem created the world, he put into place ways that people who are now can go way far back into the past and way far forward into the future. This is, I mean, we embrace this idea to some degree when we quote the famous Midrash that we were all at Harsinai, right? So if we were all at Harsinai, that means that we have a, a past, whether it's, you know, a collective unconscious, call it whatever you will, that's part of us. That's not logical, right? That's super logical. But we embrace that, right? We also embrace this idea, and we'll talk about this in a couple minutes in the Ramban, that sometimes people have this sixth sense about something that will happen in the future, or they will have, my students always ask me, like, you know, is that like deja vu, where you have a dream, and then you dream of something that you've never seen, you've never been there, and then lo and behold, like the next day or the next week, something comes to be. And the way I understand it, yes, because our nishamot, our souls, that being that our nishamot are part of the divine, we have programmed in us that ability to somehow tap into things that transcend time. So sorcery and astrology were real sciences then. Right? And Chazal completely supported their existence and their legitimacy. Right? The Midrashim are replete with, and the magicians of Paro said. Right? The most famous one of which is, which is very relevant to next week, is right. why did Paro decree that all the babies, boy babies, be thrown into the river? 
because his astrologers came to him and they, they said, we have foreseen that a savior of the Jews is going to arise and his undoing will be through water. They got it wrong. They got part of it. Well, they got it right and they got it wrong. They got it right. And the, the Gemara, I just did this, looked at this Gemara in the Sechet Sanhedrin. They said that there are three instances of people who got the correct information and misinterpreted it. And this is one of those examples, right? Another example is why did Korach rebel against Moshe and think he could get away with it? Because he saw in a Nevoa that his, or in, in, the, in the stars, that his sons would serve in Mishnah. In Mishkan, right? We say some of our Tehillim are Lam Natseach Livnei Korach, right? One of those descendants is Shmuel. Shmuel is a direct descendant of, of Korach. So again, he's right. His sons survived him, but that's because his sons did Shuvah and he did it. And I don't remember what the third example is. So clearly Chazal completely subscribed to this. There's a whole section at the end of Masechet Shabbat which discusses do the astrological signs apply to Jews or not? Right? The discussion is not, does it exist? Right? The Chachamim accept. Yesh Mazal. There is, you know, the day you're born, the time you're born, the hour you're born, the sun, the moon, the stars, whatever the day of the week, all of these somehow have a pull over a person's temperament and nature, like astrology, not the Gene Dixon variety, but the old Persian variety, the old Egyptian variety, it was a real science. The only question is, is that does Hashem, does our relationship with Hashem trump that? And the answer is yes and no. In classic Amara sense, the answer is it depends. Okay? So, so at the end of the day, the that you, this is what we say on, on Yom Kippur, on Yom Kippur, it's Shubat Tefillah, it's Takam Abirinet Roa And the Gemara brings some like incredible stories of how um, my favorite is Rabbi Akiva's daughter on the morning after she got married, she was alive. And Rabbi Akiva went to his daughter and he says, you have to tell me what you did yesterday. It's like, what do you mean what did I do yesterday? So he's like, you have to take me through your day. And she said, well, you know, I got up and I was getting ready for my wedding and everybody's running around and whatever and, and this poor person came to the kitchen and he wanted something to eat and I kind of looked around to see whether there was anybody else who could help him because it was my wedding day and I was getting ready but there was nobody to help him so I gave him food and, and you know and then I carried on and then we went to the wedding. They went over to the chair where his daughter had been sitting, right, the Kala's chair, and behind her on the chair on the floor was a poisonous snake with a pin through its eye. It's a story, the Gemara, this is in black and white on the Gemara, I'm not making this up. And he's saying, tell me what happened when you were sitting in the chair. And she says, oh, well, my headpiece was bothering me, so I took out the, hat, the hair pin and stuck it into the shrubbery behind me. So Rabbi Akiva tells her, I knew on the day that you were born that the stars foretold that you would die on the wedding day. This, because you, and that snake was clearly poised to bite you in the neck and kill you. But because you did this act of chesed, that averted your decree. So that, and he says, from here we know it's daka tatsilim of it black on it gives me chills every time I tell the story. Like this is Rabbi Akiva we're talking about. Okay, we're not talking about, you know, some woohoo, you know, Kabbalist type of guy. So so it is very clear that Chazal believe it, accept it, that's why the Torah prescribes against it. These powers in those people's hands were real powers. So the Rashbam felt that if a person comes along and through the use of black magic is able to conjure some kind of a sign, some kind of even a supernatural event, then he has the power to persuade. So the question is asked, why does God give him that power? So there's a machloket and one answer is that Hashem gives him that power specifically in order to test us. The other answer is that no, God put these powers into the world and it is our choice 
whether we use them or abuse them. Right? We, this, this person has been told, no, you can't use these things. You can't use necromancers. You can't use astrologers. And if he breaks the rules, so to speak, that's his choice. The, it's there. It's there to use or not use. So that's the Rashba. The Ibn Ezra has a slightly different answer. The Ibn Ezra is on, on the bottom, on the left. Um, well, not totally on the bottom, but on, on the left. And, and he he explains as follows. He says, Ki akum b'kirbacha navi, ta'am b'kirbacha, ki ein navi ki imi Yisrael. So the first point, and this is actually a halachic point, you can't be a navi sheker unless you're a Jew. In other words, Bilam wasn't a Navi Shekhar. The, there were prophets amongst, there were dreamers, there were, you know, Khartoumim. These did not fall under the category of Navi Shekhar because they weren't Jews. To halakhically be a Navi Shekhar, you have to be a Jew. So, and how does, what does it mean that he's, he's Shekhar? So the Ibn Ezra continues, um, and he says that, and this, this continues, I think, onto your that continues on to this page or on to the next page. But he says that, that what happens is, is that this, this there are one of two options what it means to be a Navi Shekhar. Option number one is that this is a Navi who steals somebody else's Navua. If you remember when we talked about, I think it was two weeks ago, this idea that Navua was something that was kind of a pervasive you know, radio waves. And depending on how strong your perception was, to, was the clarity with which you tuned into it, right? So that that the B'nai Nevi'im knew that Eliyahu was going to die, right? They knew it. They said it to Elisha, you know, your master's going to die. But only Elisha could actually had the power to see the process of Eliyahu going up to Shemaiah. So the Ibn Ezra was referring to this is that, like, if you are a Ben Navi and you serp you usurp somebody else's navua, somebody else's prediction, right? The sign that you are supposed to do X is that there's going to be a solar eclipse next week, right? And instead, that person uses that very real navua and very real sign to say, go do a Vodazara. That's a Navi check. So the Navi is a real Navi, gets is hears a real Navua, knows that that Navua is going to somebody else and steals it. Which is kind of very weird. Yeah. Okay. So here, let me find it inside the Ibn Ezra because he's going to say it much better than I. Um, Ibn Ezra starts and wait, that's Rashi. Down here is the Ibn Ezra. Okay, so the Ibn Ezra on that. First, he, did, he says, you know, that, that this person is a, is a Jew, he, right? He in a Bibi Israel. Um, and then he continues, and he says, V'zot ha-parasha um, d'veka ba'avur avodazara. The reason, the smichut ha between this parasha, this section on the Navi Shekhar and the previous one is because of content of avodazara. Right? Ki... Sreifat ha banim avodazara, because avodat ha which is the immediate thing before, is avodazara. Navi shia omer ki im bekeikits diber Hashem. Whether he says, God spoke to me when I was in a state of awakeness. Oh, shiluho imo. Okay, or he's, that I'm God's messenger. Oh, um, Oh, b'chalom, or he says it in a dream, right? So option one is is this person who comes along, this credible former Navi comes along, and he says, God spoke to me. Right? It's a Jew, it's somebody who was a Navi, and he's just lying. So that's option A. But option B, right, the yesh omen, he goes on, ki itachin lihiyot, it's probable, what's more probable, shehanavi, here. So I think it's on the third page. 
Yeah. Um, the bananas was again on the left side, but this time all the way at the top. Mimigneve um, davar Hashem. This Navi is stealing a Navua. It's as if, like, you know how, I don't know if this still works on cable, but like once upon a time, you could sometimes get HBO and it would just kind of come through even though you weren't paying for it, that type of thing. That's the metaphor. It's like you would hear the Navua that's going to him and you would swipe it. And you would say, I got this Navua from Hashem, that this and this and this was going to happen, and that this and this and this is a sign that we should go serve Ba'a. So you really did hear a Navua, but it wasn't yours, so you stole it from somebody else and you perverted it. But you still have the power to hear it. Correct. So that's the, you that's are the still course. a navi. A navi sheker is that. That's the crazy thing, and that's the hard thing. And we're going to look at a case of this in in Yirmiyahu in a minute. You're still a navi. You just you're abusing your navi power, or you were a navi. Remember these, you know, except for Moshe, you could not control when you got navua or not. But if you had had navua in the past, you certainly knew how to think it. Mm. Right? And you certainly had the street credibility. You had your Navi card. Right? You had you were a card carrying member of the Navi Association of Israel. So this was and this is what happened. Um, right? So Sheamar Navi Haemet, this true Navi said, Shahaya Otkah, um Lahatstiko, and he uses a sign to to he uses a sign to prove himself. So this is a, you know, this is a tough call. The Ramban, you go back kind of to the previous, to the second side of the previous page, he says something even more amazing, which relates directly to us. Right? The Ramban is living in the mid to late 1200s. Um, so if you find the Ramban on the right-hand column, hmm? there you go. Okay. Find the Ramban in the right hand the right hand column. Right, Yud Gimel Bet Ki Yakum BeKirbacha Navi Ocholem Kalo. Okay, Yikra Eno Had Katuv Navi Al Pi Atzma. Okay, so according to the Ram, Ramban, it's a little bit different. This isn't a accredited Navi. This is a self proclaimed Navi. Okay, Sheyomar Hu Ki Diber Imi BeHakitz. Hashem spoke to me and told me to do X, Y, Z. But here's the interesting thing. That the text is in fact hinting at something that is true. It really exists. Because there are people who have in their souls prophetic ability. Yedu bo atidot. And they really do know the future. Lo yada ha'ish me'ayin yavo bo. This person doesn't know where it's coming from. Aval yitbodeid. He isolates himself. In other words, he puts himself in a med meditative state. V'tavo um, bo ruach leimor. And in fact, the spirit does come to him and, and talks to him. This is what's going to happen in the future. As regard to, to such and such. And the philosophers, meaning like Aristotle, call him Kahin. Like a Kohen, basically. Right? So what the Ramban is saying is, is that there are people, even today, who are psychics, who have ESP, who have deja vu, who really can know somehow the future. These are real phenomena, but they don't know where it comes from. They don't know how, how to control it, and they're not a Navi. And this is something that's really, really important that pertains to, and, and here, you know, I, I am going to insert whatever little 
unpaid political announcement, so to speak, is that, you know, and this is not coming from me, this is coming from a lot of Rabbanim, is that one of the dangers in being a religious Zionist is making the leap from interpreting the words of Tanakh to extrapolating the words of Tanakh in the sense that there is no more nevuah anymore. This is, this is a fact. Nevuah is closed for now. At the time, at the beginning of the time of the second Beit HaMikdash, um, the Jews came to Ezra. I don't know if I told you guys this already or not, but for those of you who are here, it can be repeated. Um, the Jews came to Ezra and they said, look, we, the first Beit HaMikdash got destroyed because of our desire to do a Vodazar. We're back here in Israel. A Vodazar is all around us. We hey everyone, it's time for Bechadapa. Very exciting. Ninth graders, you're in your regular room, except for Ms. Malin's group, you're in room 231 instead. Tenth graders, you're in your regular rooms. Enjoy. Have a good afternoon. Okay. So the people came to Ezra and came to the Anshik Nesed Agadola and said, look, we're back in Israel. There's a Vodazara all around us. We're already tempted. We don't want to blow this a second time. Could you please intercede with God on our behalf and remove this desire for a Vodazara from us? And this is also in the Gemara. This is, I think, in the if I'm not mistaken. So Ezra does. Ezra and the Anshik Nesed Agadola, they do something. They say something. They write something down. They throw it up to Shemayim. And, and bam, the desire for a Vodazara is gone. But so is Nebuah. So is Nebuah. Because there are two sides of one coin. If you are so intimately in tune with the spirit world that you can somehow genuinely believe that this table is an embodiment of a god, it's that same in tuneness that allows you to be in tune with what Hashem is actually transmitting. So the two go hand in hand. And once the desire for Avodazara was turned off, so was the ability to receive true and complete nevuah. So it is a fact that there is no such thing as true, complete nevuah anymore. However, there are still these waves that are floating around out there. It, it exists. We're just shut down. So what the Ramban is saying is, is that, no, but there are certain people who can still hear that and can internalize that and can interpret that. But it's not nevuah. So what tripped us up with Yirmiyahu? Why didn't the people understand that he really was okay. a servant of God? So let's let's look at the story in, in Yirmiyahu. Um, I don't know if you brought Tanakhim or not. Can I just ask a different question? Yes. Um, I don't know if you covered this, but what about um, when Rivka was pregnant and she went to a person for, interesting, not her husband, who she right. knew had Navua. Um, to explain, you know, what was happening. Or with she her. got her own nevuah. In other words, in Tzemachok, it says, uh -huh. Right, so the question is, is, did she go to some kind of an intermediary, uh -huh. according to the Midrash, maybe Shame, maybe Aver, um, or did she get her own nevuah? Because, again, this was, this was real. There were, Abraham was not the only monotheist. There were others. He was just the first monotheist to preach it to the masses. In other words, Adam spoke to Hashem, Noah spoke to Hashem. This ability to commune with the divine was something that people had, and they knew how to access. The problem became, the further you got from Adam, the more that power was ascribed to things other than Hashem, and it got bifurcated. So it's like that, you know, so rather than you know, you hear something coming out of a tree, and rather than realizing that what you're really hearing is Hashem, not the tree, people assumed they were hearing the tree. And therefore the tree would become a god, or the rock would become a god, or the earth would become a god. So it was, this was real. It just got, like, misattributed, I guess is probably the best way to mm -hmm. describe it. Yeah. Okay, so Hananiah ben Azur, which is in Sefer Yemiyah and Perek Kafchet, um, Chapter Jeremiah chapter 28 is a fascinating and incredibly tragic story. Okay? And I remember when 
many, many years ago, Menachem Liebtag gave a shiur on this, like, you know, I had the same question. How were they supposed to know? The answer is they didn't. They didn't, and here Miyahu did. Okay, so, so I'm just going to kind of go, go through this story. Um, so it's, it's really towards the end of, the, it's the beginning of Tzidkiah, who's the last king before the destruction of the temple. So it's about, let's say, 10 years, 10, 11 years before the destruction of the temple, but already after what's known as Galut Choresh Masker, the exile of the elite. The previous king, Yehoyachin, was a, a fervent you know, nationalist, and he tried to rebel against Babel, against Babylon, even though Yemiahu told him not to. He did anyway. He was summarily exiled with his family, with all the elite, with all the people who were educated, etc., etc. So this is, this is post. That Tzibkiyahu was a, a Babylonian puppet. Um, but he was one of, he was the last of Yoshiahu's three sons. So he was royal. Okay? Um, so he was the king. So it was, and, and so that, this is the time period. Okay? And, um, and, and this guy, Amar Eli, Hanania ben Azur, Hanavi, he's described as being a Navi. He was from Givon, and he came to, to the Beit HaMikdash, um, and to and in front of the Kohanim and all of the people say, "Ko Amar Hashem Tzvakot." So says God, that Lemor Shibarti et Ol Melach Babel. I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. The Od Shnatayim in another two years, Ani Meishiv El Hamakom Hazeh et Kol Klei Beit Hashem Asher Lakach Nebuchadnezzar Melach Babel. So two years from now, not only is there not going to be a destruction, but I'm going to bring back the, the vessels from, from, Bab from Babel. That he took to Babel. The Ed Yechoniah, Ben Yehoiakim, and Yechoniah, the son of Yehoiakim, I'm sorry, he was the grandson of Yoshiahu, the son of Yehoiakim, the king of Yehuda. And the Ed called Galut Yehuda, Habaim, and this whole elite group that was exiled, Bavela Ani Meishiv, Elam HaKomazah, I will return to this place, Ne'um Hashem, Ki Ani Yashbor Et Ul Melch Bavel, because I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Okay? Sounds very credible. He's referred to as a Navi. Vayomer Yumiyah Navi. Same stats. El Hananya Hanavi. Okay, the text makes it really clear that they are, so to speak, equals. Le'eneha kohanim, in front of the kohanim, le'enei kohanim, in front of the people, ha'undim be'en the Beit HaMikdash. Okay, so this isn't just happening anywhere, this is the Times Square of Jerusalem. Vayomer yemiyah ha'navi, amen, kein ya'aseh Hashem, so should God do, ya'kim Hashem et varecha, Hashem should uphold your words, asher nibeta, that you have prophesied, lahashiv klei Beit Hashem, and what's fascinating is that we don't know because we weren't there and there are no notes left behind whether he was saying this sarcastically like from your mouth to God's ears but it ain't happening whether whether he was saying this sincerely in other words it is eminently possible that at this moment Yirmiya did not know whether Hanania the Nazur was telling the truth or not. Because the rule of Nabur is that a bad Nabur can always be overturned, but a good Nabur cannot. So Yirmiya had plenty of bad Nabuot in the sense, and he continues, and he says, <laughs> But listen to this thing. Okay, that I speak before you. There are all these prophets that prophesy bad things. 
בבוא דבר הנביא, ייוודע הנביא אשר ישלח השם באמת. Okay, so the only way we're going to know who's right and who's wrong is by seeing what happens. He's not saying you're wrong. He's saying only time will tell. Vayikach Hanani Hanavi. He still called Hanavi here, right? Et ha mote ve me'al tzavaro Yirmiya Hanavi vayishbereh. So he takes this this yoke that Yirmiya was wearing as a symbol of submission to God, and he broke it. Um, and he broke it. And then by Yomer Hanania, and Hanania said, Le'inei kol ha'am, le'mor, ko'amar Hashem, so says Hashem, kacha eshbor et ol nevuchadnetzer. This was not, he was not rebelling against Yirmiyahu. People think that this is, he was challenging Yirmiyahu. He wasn't, at least not overtly. And just like I broke this, this um, yoke, so God will and by the way, that's, the def that's a possible definition of what an ot omofet is. In other words, an ot omofet doesn't have to be a miracle. It could just be an action. In other words, God told me to do this. And that my doing this is a predictor of X. Be'ot um, time in another two years, you know, God is going to break Nebuchadnezzar and, and etc. So then what happened after this? Okay, so then they, it says, and then he and by Yelach Yirmiyah Hanavi Ladarko, right? He went off. By Yidav Hashem El Yirmiyah Acharei Shvor. So now Hashem comes to Yirmiyahu and says, and he says, Haloch ve'amar to El Hanania, go to Hanania. Note, Hanavi is dropped. Go speak to Hanania, say, Ko Amar Hashem. So says God. Um, the one that the Tzavar, the one that you broke, right? Hello, I'm sorry. Um, mof, mo, motate, I think it says. Motate eats Shavata. You broke a yoke of wood. The Asita Tachtena Motot Barzel and make iron yokes. He koamar Hashem Tzavakot Eloke Yisrael. All Barzel Natati Al Tzavar. The Al Hagoyim Al Tzavar. Right? That, that, no, you're wrong. I, I made an, I, I, Nebuchadnezzar is going to triumph. Um, and everybody's going to rule him. And all animals are going to rule him. Vayomer Yirmiya Hanavi, Yirmiya El Hananya Hanavi. It's interesting that it sticks it back in here. Shma Na Hananya. Lo shilachacha Hashem. God did not send you. This is a personal, private confrontation, not a public one. Ve'ata hiftachta et ha'am hazeh al shekir. It's only once Hashem comes to Yirmiyahu and tells him, no, Hanania ben Azur is a Navi shekir, that Yirmiyahu goes back to Hanania and confronts him which also leads us to believe that it is possible that Hanania didn't really realize that he was lying. Either he was lying intentionally to make people feel better, or he himself was misinterpreting a real nevuah. He blew it. You're wrong. But when you're a navi, being wrong is the same thing as lying. It's not just making a mistake. You can't make a mistake when you're a navi. Maybe he didn't have such clarity, like exactly. he had brainwaves, but it wasn't so clear right. what the message was. But that means that you are now no longer qualified to be a Navi. And as a Navi, you should know when a Navua is not clear enough, and you should back away from it. Like you, you so failed. is that what led the people to imprison Yirmiyahu? This whole confusion? Yes, or? It, was, it was exactly that. It was a confusion. So, Lachen um, Hashem, so therefore says, Hashem, you know, you're... you're you're wrong, and then Hanania dies. Okay, that kind of is the signal, at least to Yirmiyahu, but not necessarily to the people. And they wanted to believe that Babel was, going, to yeah, right. badly. Right. So. so here's Yirmiyahu telling them two chapters earlier. This building, God's house, 
your temple, the thing that has been around for over 400 years, right? The, the best analogy that I, I mean, you guys can relate to this more than, than my current students, but the World Trade Center was finished in, I think, 1975. So the World Trade Center stood for exactly 26 years. And how horrified were we when that building came down? Not just because of how it came down, which was so horrific, but there was this sense that, you know, this was our ziggurat. Right? We built the tallest building in the world. We are great. We are mighty. That building is impenetrable. That building is indestructible. It clearly wasn't. Right? So that was 26 years. This structure had stood for 400 going on 450 years. And now Yumiya was coming along and saying, this house is going to get destroyed because God is going to destroy it. They thought he was that he was the voice of Satan. Not only was he saying that, he was saying capitulate to Baba. The example that I give to my students is when Ehud Barak was prime minister, right? And he was ready to give away East Jerusalem. We all thought that he was evil incarnate. What if he was right? You know, because that's what Yirmiyahu said. Make peace with the, with the end, make peace, forget about with the Palestinians. Subjugate yourself to Iran. That's what he was saying. This is what God wants. God wants you to subjugate, to submit to Iran, to sign whatever deal with, that Iran is offering. For, and for the next 70 years, you have to submit to Iran. But I promise you that in 70 years, I will overthrow Iran. Either that person would get tried for treason, or if the government decides to be nice to him, we'll lock him up in a mental institution. Certainly we're not going to listen to him. That was Yirmiyahu. Yirmiyahu would walk into an orthodox shul, Bethlehem, Bnei Shurin, Rina, whatever, pick your shul, give the drush a Shabbos morning and saying, hi, you know all of you guys that are here this morning? God doesn't want you here. He doesn't want your prayers. He doesn't want your Shmirat Shabbos. You know why? Because you're cheating on your taxes. And because you're running schemes to, you know, re to, to give money to Tzedakah by selling organs through donations and, you know, or you're beating your wives or you're taking drugs or you're, what, name your crime du jour, right? But, and, and here you are, on Shabbat morning, in Shul, Shomer Shabbat, Shomer Kashrut, you know, next morning, you're, you know, you, the men are going to come to Shul with their talit, with their tefillin, you're going to go home to your completely kosher kitchen that you've now made completely Pesach did, and Yumiyahu stands up from the pulpit and says, no, God doesn't want this. Like, that's, that's terrifying. Because the people, and this was what, what Rabbi Liebtag said, was that this was really what the Horban was. That you no longer knew who spoke the word of Hashem and who didn't. And you, because you so desperately wanted to be happy and because you so desperately wanted to feel good about yourself, you all lied to yourselves. Because you know darn well that doing a Vodazara can't coexist with serving Hashem. And being an immoral human being cannot coexist with a kosher home. It just can't, mm -hmm. right? And that, that goes back to the emeth and sheker. It's not, there's certain things that just can't coexist side by side. The people would go to the Beit HaMikdash in the morning and then go, literally go down into the valley across the street and sacrifice their children in the afternoon. It's like, okay, but that, that's, you know, it's like, going to shul in the morning and going to a Greek Orthodox church in the afternoon, you know, and kneeling and, and you know, doing, and I say Greek Orthodox because that's, that's the one denomination that, that modern rabbis still haven't completely wrapped their heads around, whether that's a Vodazar or not, because there's so much iconography in it and there's such a division, you know, it's, it's different than the Roman Catholic Church and, you know, that's like, I've heard rabbis say, you can go into the Sistine Chapel, but you cannot go into this Greek Orthodox Church. Just, it's a different kind of Catholicism that's still much closer to real idol worship. It's very interesting. But you get the general idea. So these were real people. These were real Nevi'im. These were, these were credible 
people, it's a terrifying thought that somebody comes along and says, forget about saying go worship a Vodazar, I'm saying that God is going to redeem us in two years, don't worry about it. Did he have a reputation beforehand? So oh, yeah. This saying. was, well, he had been a Navi now for, this was the beginning of Tzidkiyahu, he's been around since the 13th year of Yoshio, I think Yoshio was king for 18 years, so he's been, he's been Navi for a good 25, 30 years by now. I think he's a Navi for a total of 40. This is the 30th year. So, I mean, if you already ha have a reputation, then there is reason that people realize that you are someone who has God's ear, per, you know. Um. Right, but Hanania clearly had a reputation also. Oh, did he? And then there were other Nuvium, right? We know that there were tons and tons of Nuvium at the time. We just know the ones that we hear about. Right. So... You know, it's like literally like one rabbi gets up from the pulpit and says thing A, and another rabbi gets up from the pulpit and says thing B. And they both have smicha from, from the rabbi, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, and this is just variations in halacha where the stakes aren't quite so high, and yet we still see it in, you know, centrist Orthodox society, how difficult it is to figure out who's right. Well, it wasn't there a, like anything you spoke earlier about how like uh, there was a like a pet like um, an a order hierarchy. a hierarchy? Thank you. Mm -hmm. of, so like there would be someone at the top and who would be teaching the others. So was Yirmiyahu at the top and teaching the others, or we don't really know at this point. So at this point, it seems that Yirmiyahu is at the top. Also at this point, Yirmiyahu is one of the few that are left right? because the parak before when this exile went, a lot of the Nevi'im, including Yechezkel, went. With him, and Yirmiyahu sent Yechezkel. So basically, at this point, the only Yirmiyahu theoretically had no rivals. On the other hand, you could also perceive him as this old crazy guy, which is exactly how they perceived him: was an old crazy guy who's treasonous. Previous king had uh, Yehoiakim had taken something that he had written and publicly thrown it into a fire. And so the king had no respect when we showed no respect for the prophet. So, you know, it's a really dark and confusing time for them. And, and you know, can you blame them? So this goes back to, I guess, where we started, which is that the thing that makes us human is that each one of us has this piece of the divine in us, and therefore each one of us is responsible to be able to discern what's divine and what's fake. And, and that's what Hashem says right here by the Navi Shekhar. Hashem is, does this in a way to force you. The Ramban says that it's only a test if we perceive it as a test. Right? If you know one is telling the truth and one's lying, it's no big deal. But you don't know that you have that ability until Hashem puts you in that position. Now, you don't know if you really know the information unless you're called on it to present that information. So what the Torah is telling us is that sometimes Hashem is going to do this to us. He's going to force us to reflect and to evaluate and kind of listen to our own inner body and figure out, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what goes together, what doesn't, what's hypocrisy, what's really intolerable. And that's, you know, that's why it's still relevant to us, even though there is no one. Well, I'm not happy though. <laughs> <laughs> what about Shavtet Svi? A little later, later. It, it, was he on the level of a Navi? He was not on a level of a Navi, but he convinced hundreds of thousands of people that he was Mashiach. Were educated people, like Edu it was highly educated yes. people, Ashkenaz, not just the poor, you know, not just the poor North Africans, not even just the poor shtetl Jews, but from from Germany and from Holland and places that, that people were established and wealthy and you know it's it's really mind-boggling to think of this phenomenon that you had you know, hundreds of thousands of people believing that this man was so was Shia. he a misguided Navi from like a, a sort well, of look, even even Rabbi Akiva got right thought, out. thought that Bar Kokhba right like that sometimes the the desire to the need for salvation is so great that's right? just that somebody just arises and everybody 
gloms onto them, and then, at well, least from what really I understand good. about Chapter Tzvi, and once upon a time I read a book like this, that of yeah. Barnard and Professor Yerushalmi was my, my professor, and he literally wrote the book on Chapter Tzvi, and, and Smodar Rosenzweig was his TA. So, is that Shabtai Tzvi started off pure. He really believed this. He was not setting out to dupe people. He didn't think he was duping people, which is why I think Hanania didn't think he was duping people. And it, you know, it gets to the point where you believe your own press. And then at that final moment, when he was asked to perform a miracle, either he chickened out or he really kind of realized, OK, you know, this is the critical moment, and I would rather be a live dog than a dead lion. But it's, there are still Sabbateans alive today. There are still people who believe, you know, and that's the danger with any kind of charismatic leader that you look to is that how is that charisma used and abused by your followers? You know, just pretty much what's happening to the, to the legacy of the Lubavitch Rebbe is that, that his legacy has been used by people who need that kind of light and inspiration. So it's a cautionary tale. Um, use power responsibly. <laughs>